Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces Part 1, Stratton Dreams Book 1, Desolation's Tears Read by the author Chapter 16 Hard Times Aboard the Lucky Strike 1 <laughs> My Dante's gone! was all Veslin could muster through her sobs and tears. She tried to stand, and only rose from her seat high enough to drop the partially filled bottle of vodka that rested lopsided in her lap to the floor with a dull thud. Tiff, huddled at her side, was startled. Talitha swiftly dropped to one knee to catch Veslin before she could fall on her face. Her friend Tal had seen her drunk more times than Veslin could remember, sometimes so staggeringly that the tall redhead had practically carried her home. But she'd never been as broken as this. Angry, yes, most often at Dante himself. That he'd sobered up when she couldn't, and that he'd still loved her anyway. It wasn't fair. Having Tal see her like this was greater humiliation than she could take. Help me, Veslin croaked. What do you need? Talitha said. I need... Veslin began before stuttering off. Talitha and Tiff locked eyes, sharing their mutual concern. But then Veslin regained her thoughts and voice. I... I... Need to stand. Talitha locked one arm in an iron grip and lifted Veslin effortlessly to her feet. Talitha provided all the stability required as Veslin then led the way to the hangar's kitchenette. I've been trying to get her up for most of the afternoon, Tiff said, trying to be helpful as always. Coffee, Veslin blurted. Lots of coffee. Black. I'm on it, Tiff chirped and scurried behind the kitchenette's counter. And a couple of those damn detox pills that taste like shike, Veslin added, practically spitting out their taste already. She lowered her head as if she might heave up the contents of her stomach. Yet Veslin began the longer, slower process of emptying her heart instead. Now, tell me, Tal, what is it you came here for? Talitha needed a ship. She'd said as much. Only Veslin's wasn't there. Talitha appeared to hesitate, as if inwardly debating over her long-term needs versus the immediate concern before her. She appeared to commit to the present. What happened, Vez? Talitha asked. Dante took a job, Veslin said. Only once begun, she realized she'd primed the pump, and it would all come out until some decisive conscious effort was made to stop it. Only Veslin knew the deeper truth, that whatever had happened, it had been set in motion long before that weasel, Flint, had ever made his offer that took Dante and the crew of the Lucky Strike on their doomed final run. The end really began when Veslin had accepted the partnership with Dante Stokes and Son Shipping and signed the deal Body, Heart, and Soul. They'd start anew, beginning their lives again fresh, amidst the season of frozen hell on the planet Desolation. Never had a world in all the history of the Strata been so aptly named. And yet it was the enforced social hibernation of deepest winter that allowed Veslin and Dante to bond so deeply with each other. Tiff ignored them for the most part, happy as she was to wait out the five months of outer darkness by tinkering away on the Lucky Strike's internal systems. 
as if those nights were as her life would always be. Once what passed for spring released them from desolation's reoccurring tomb, Captain Traskin flew the ship, Tiff kept her running, and Dante brought the business acumen that allowed him and his late father's shipping endeavor to thrive, even in the face of Confed's seemingly never-ending war against private industry. He still had all their old contacts, and those still had their ongoing needs. Debts were paid, a few luxuries acquired, Mere satisfaction transitioned effortlessly to mutual love. But then the Confed Executor Board and its damned High Secretariat Ashlock authorized the tightening of the screws even further with yet another surcharge added to their annual shipping license. Along with increased stratum tolls, the introduction of brand new translation tariffs, plus the overall rising taxation on the gross tonnage of all product shipped. Dante had never considered himself an advocate of conspiracies, but he'd become skeptical of anyone who justified the executorium while denying they were actually designing a system specifically intended to break independence driving individual traders to sell their businesses to the larger, executor-represented franchises, to thereafter serve as mere employees aboard their own ships. Dante refused to submit to any part of being voluntarily broken. Veslin had granted him a new lease on life that he wasn't going to waste. Dante had concocted a plan. He stepped up their contracts and had the trio working around the clock, taking breaks only when Tiff suggested the engines needed to cool down. The translation drive was running hot most of the time, and if left unchecked is what typically led to translation accidents of the kind that had claimed Dante Sr. Yet it still seemed to Veslin that they were working twice as hard to fall behind only half as fast. They simply couldn't score the larger, more profitable contracts with only the three of them on a shift. She concluded it was all her fault, failing her father's legacy by having drunk all her motivation away. Her solution? Drink until Dante noticed, then curse him for failing to stop her. Only Dante had noticed. When he tried to stop her, she cursed him for interfering in her life. And Tiff watched it all in silence. 2. Less than two years into the new partnership, with one last shipping run scheduled before deepest winter rolled around once more, Veslin intentionally made it seem as if she was too drunk to fly. It wasn't that she had suggested she might be a danger to the flight, but she did what she needed to do so that Dante would fear she was. He still took Tiff as planned, and they left her behind. But with only two doing the work of three, the lucky strike missed the deadline that would have seen them safely home while planetary navigation was still possible. Dante used those five months to take more jobs, pushing the ship harder than Tiff felt was safe. But the spunky engineer kept them in one piece while becoming a young woman at the same time. Veslin missed it. Dante did the best he could to fill the void she had left. Like father, like daughter, was all Veslin could tell herself. Only her own father had abandoned her honorably. Nothing like the shike storm she'd made of everything. But it was in those months that she finally learned to navigate the subterranean tunnels, found the edge, fast service, 
for those who want to slow down and made the acquaintance of a stoic loner she came to know as Tal. As Veslin's second frozen hell came to an end, there was to be no celebration this time. The hydraulic pressure that opened the great bay doors of the hangar against the metric tons of accumulated snow abruptly resounded throughout the nearly silent domicile. Upon landing, she noticed changes in Tiff's stance and gait almost immediately, as the new young woman ran down the ship's ramp, even as it was still descending and she practically leapt into Veslin's arms. Oh my Vez, Tiff shouted as they embraced. I missed you so much. There's so much to tell you, so much has happened. And Dante could have never made it without knowing you were here waiting for him. Oh, Vez, he missed you so much. Veslin's prepared facade melted. Tiff's effusion was so contagious. She spilled a tear as she replied, I missed you too, kiddo. Veslin hated that her voice cracked. She rolled her eyes, then saw Dante, standing at the top of the ramp watching them. He held a handful of weeds that were pretty enough to pass for flowers. How do I get in on this welcome home, pretty lady? he asked. Veslin broke from Tiff's embrace and fully realized all she'd missed. Dante knew what she'd done that had prompted their separation, and he'd already forgiven her. We need to talk was all Veslin had to offer him in return. There were formalities in birthing the ship, and Tiff had planned a full diagnostic starting the very next morning. She crashed in her own bed as if she'd never slept before. That gave Veslin and Dante the evening to themselves, and in addition to their reunion meal, Veslin had also prepared a long-delayed counteroffer to his proposal of nearly three years before. I had documents drawn up while you were gone, she said matter-of-factly. She started drinking, knowing the whole conversation would go down smoother with a vodka chaser. Dante sighed. And I get no say in the matter? Silence. Where are you and Tiff going to go? You misunderstand me, Veslin murmured as if ashamed. We're not going anywhere. I'm not leaving, she added, lowering her head. You're kicking me out of my father's hangar, he said, as if challenging her to a duel. And this is after I brought you these flowers. The shafts of weeds were just lying on the table between them. Colorful but there was no point in placing them in any water, as they needed to die before their pollen could prove a problem. No, Veslin said in exasperation. I'm giving you the ship. He truly didn't know what to say. Veslin continued. It cost more than we could afford, but I was still able to scrounge up enough while you were gone to sign the lucky strike over to you. He'd raised his own glass, but then set it down firmly. I am not taking your ship. He seemed angry. You have to, she said. I already paid for the transfer. Now that you're back, you just have to sign it. Dante was quiet long enough that Veslin thought she'd have to break the silence. And she really didn't know what else she could add. But then he broke it himself. How do I reach you, he said, and his voice had lost its edge. He continued when she had no response. It's like you've twisted your outer shell into some kind of monster that drives everyone away. But inside, you're still there. The little girl's daddy flew away and left you in charge. She took another drink to reinforce his observation, about the exterior at least. We can go into redemption proper tomorrow and make everything legal. 
He spoke in even tones. I'm signing nothing without knowing why. You know why, she snapped. And I'm also the deadly bastard that's going to make you say it, he said. And he glared as he'd once had at the grubber Telchin when Tiff's life was on the line. She resented him. Because you're the better captain, she answered, as if accusing him of outright murder. No, that's shike and you know it, he defied her. She was prepared to meet his gaze, but then realized she couldn't. He was right. She knew the real reason. Tiff's life, her, her future, is tied up in that ship, Veslin began. Only she needs both a mother and a father. She trailed off, so Dante confirmed. That's right. And it's just that I know I've done a shake job at both roles. There it was. The girl had saved her life. Only Veslin had already committed herself to the wreckage she'd become. Dante finally downed his own drink in one gulp. He set his glass down hard. He burped loud and long. He stared at her and finally said, You're a better pilot than me. And Tiff needs you, regardless of what you think of yourself. She had questions that I had no good answers to give her. We figured it out, but the whole five months out there, she couldn't stop talking about you. Veslin smirked. Her pride had been willing to accept the compliment of her piloting. But Tiff rarely spoke at all. She was perpetually greasing up her nose and cheeks in the bowels of the engines, as if they were her true family. But Dante would not be deterred when he knew he was right. You may have noticed that little girl is like no other little girl in the Strada. She's an innocent, the only genuine one I've ever met. Definitely not like you and me. And Comfed would crush that innocence right out of her if it ever got the chance. It's a miracle she found you where and when she did. Because I'm shaken convinced that without Captain Veslin Traskin, then the Tifatas Ranian we think we know, well, I don't believe she would even be here anymore. Veslin pushed some nuggets of processed meal around on her plate. But I spent money, she mumbled. I made it official. You just need to sign. Then I'll sign, he huffed. I'll be the damned Captain Stokes if I have to be. But I won't trust anyone else in that pilot's chair but you. Veslin nodded her head and cried. This wasn't the homecoming she'd intended. Hers was to be bitter and unforgiving. Dante's was unconditional. He smiled and gestured toward her bottle. So, you go ahead, finish that. You drink as much as you need to. He paused. Then you welcome me back home. Three. They were two lost souls who just kept trying to make it work. Dante never did sign the papers. Veslin looked into the swirling black surface of her second cup of coffee, realizing that most of what she'd said had been rambling, coherent only to herself. Tao was being patient, but Veslin knew that her patience would inevitably reveal its limits. While Tiff was her ever-supportive self, making it far too easy to forget that she'd lost Dante as well. Veslin needed to get her reminiscence back on track, stick to the tangibles that had truly brought her to this moment. The job. That damned shike job. 
Dante had used the extra credits he'd earned in their five months of separation to hire a crew for the Lucky Strike. His rationale was that through such an investment, they could take on larger contracts, get themselves out of the hole the system had spiraled them into. The seven hires were all good workers, but when Dante caught one lingering too long wherever Tiff was to be found, usually in the aft engine block, he and Dante had words that came to blows. Dante later told Veslin he'd taken out the trash, and a replacement was hired the next day. After all they'd been through together, Veslin conceded that was the moment she finally fell in love with Dante Stokes. How proud her father, Karis, would have been and how undeserving she felt in reaping all the selfless actions he'd been sowing on their mutual behalf. Once Veslin was assured the new crew serving under the fledgling Captain Stokes was everything Dante hoped they'd be, she'd played the drunk card yet again. The last thing he needed was the liability she represented. In retrospect, she suddenly realized that was when she finally broke Dante's heart. When he came to the realization that he could save her from every danger the Strata threatened them with, except herself. With Veslin staying behind more often than not, Dante asked Tiff to stay with her, to maintain the lucky strike only between halls. Of course she agreed, but it wasn't long before her incessant need to tinker on all things mechanical led her to offer her expertise throughout the entire hangar district, working long days away, but always back by evening to make sure Veslin was keeping herself relatively sober, safe, and sane. It wasn't living. It was existence. But then Dante returned from one long haul with news that promised to change everything. 4. Dante's eyes had regained their sparkle. His grin was wider. He'd bought a bottle of such a premium-grade wine that one glance told Veslin it was from a vintage in the Primean stratum they otherwise couldn't afford. And this time, the flowers were the real deal. I bring gifts, he'd said, and the news we've been waiting for, baby. Veslin would have sworn he'd been killed and replaced by some ancient alien evil, and this persona was its mockery of a human life. His joy was too real. It must have been the look on her face that made him get to the point the way he did. Do you know a guy who goes by the name Flint? Dante asked. Veslin thought it was familiar, but it was Tiff who said she'd met him once. He creeped me out, Tiff added. Aye, Dante agreed. He's a lecherous little man. But he's also second in charge of all desolations underworld. Veslin's mood immediately darkened. You promised me you'd never use my father's ship for anything illicit. And I'm not, Dante declared. Both Tiff and you agree this Flint guy's a creep, Veslin argued. And your father used the lucky strike to smuggle cogs, Dante dared, raising the stakes. Are you going to tell me that wasn't illegal? Legally, yes, Veslin admitted. But if my father did it, then it was the moral thing to do. Dante just stood there with the expensive bottle of wine and the real flowers, his face and tone exposing his growing exasperation. Well, it all depends on who you talk to. My father lived through all that uprising shike too, and he told me stories about those damned things. Kogs were nasty. The old Idunai called them abominations for a reason. 
It wasn't his words that made her turn and walk away, but the implied indictment of her father having questionable morals. Tiff just shrugged her shoulders, no doubt in response to some confused look on Dante's face. Veslin, please, Dante called after her, following her out of the hangar bay while the rest of the crew settled the ship into its dock. Tiff seemed briefly conflicted over which direction to commit her attention. She chose to follow Dante on Veslin's heels. This isn't what I intended, Dante said, and Veslin was pleased to hear genuine pain in his voice. She was glad she'd hurt him, and then she despised herself for it. There's nothing illegal, illicit, or even morally ambiguous, Dante pled his case. I made sure it's a salvage operation off of some big asteroid nobody's ever cared about before. Tiff perked up at the description. Veslin stopped at the counter and poured herself a shot of vodka in direct defiance of Dante's gift. And why would Flint hire someone like you for something like that? She turned her head askance to glance down into her drink while keeping a peripheral view on his reaction. Dante grunted and tossed the flowers onto a nearby table. He was bitter. He picked me because we're honest. Me and the boys have worked our asses off this past year, building a reputation. You know, when the worst people in the strata come to respect your integrity. He trailed off. Veslin looked up at him. It should mean something, she said. He looked her in the eye. It should. I'm sorry, she said. Veslin took her unsipped drink, and with steady hands, she poured its contents back into the bottle. <sighs> Tell me the details, she said. 5. Veslin relayed none of this conversation to Talitha, but she still relived its emotional potency as she shared the particulars that were relevant. Some off-world goon named Onath controlled most of the Golian Stratum's illicit activities that flourished under the Executorium's cultural radar. Gambling, prostitution, prohibited substances, as well as a finger or two in nearly every regional government, skimming a little profit from whatever Comfed skimmed off the top of everyone else. But it was Onath's wife, Tessa, who controlled the operations here on Desolation, while Flint was the subordinate who actually greased all the wheels and kept the local operation running smoothly. The lucky strike was to take off in a week on a month-long round trip. They'd be back before deepest winter set in, because they had to. Flint was emphatic the job be accomplished before the northern hemisphere of the planet shut down. The coordinates were to be kept secret via a navigation programming routine no one on Dante's crew could crack. They were to recover a piece of technology Flint's superiors considered so valuable that every member of the crew would be set for life. Dante, Veslin, and Tiff could even relocate to a higher stratum, like back to Imperia, or maybe Olympia if they really wanted to dream big. They could start their lives over again, for real this time. She accepted the flowers, but told him they'd save the wine to toast in victory after his return. Veslin had stopped imbibing anything for the rest of that week, assuring Dante it was so she could join him, sitting in the pilot's chair by his side aboard their ship. Tiff would accompany them, of course. 
and there would be no more efficiently run freighter unified in purpose toward a mutual goal than the Lucky Strike in all the recorded 3,000 year human history of the Strata. But on the eve of their launch, Veslin returned to her quarters following a long, luxurious shower, intending an early night's sleep so that she'd be her best the following morning, but instead discovered that Dante had broken out the candles yet again after too long an absence of any true romance in their lives. We celebrate tonight, he said. He'd already opened, aerated, and poured the wine. Their lovemaking went long and slow, and punctuated by an intensity neither had experienced with each other before. And every time she'd drain her glass, Dante would fill it again. I love you too much to take any chances, was the last thing she remembered him saying. 6. Veslin awoke the next morning, hours after the lucky strike had launched. Dante had asked Tiff to stay behind, to explain, and to promise to stay with her for as long as it took Veslin to find herself again. He said you were right, Tiff had explained. Flint wasn't to be trusted. Dante had hoped for the best, but he didn't want to risk the worst this close to finding their elusive happiness at last. He'd return in one piece, safe and sound, and he was ready for her to hate him again for a little while. They'd all be rich, and he was willing to wait her out. Of course, Veslin hated him all over again. She'd drink, she'd rage, then she'd sulk, promise never to drink again, then betray her best intentions. But more than anything else, she waited. Tiff waited with her, improving the coffee maker and other appliances while they whiled away the hours, then the days together. All this provided an explanation of sorts for why Talitha hadn't seen Veslin at the Edge Tavern for weeks. Word from the Lucky Strike had finally arrived the previous evening. Veslin had fallen asleep trying to catch the late night rebroadcast of Selmany Caduceus, that self-proclaimed, strong, discerning voice of the people. The truth was that Veslin couldn't stand the woman. Her face, that hair, that nose, those teeth or the shrill grating cackle that so often came out of them like a harpy's gossip. But Veslin never missed a segment if she could help it. Tiff was ambivalent on both Veslin's opinion and the personality, but she did receive the communication from the ship. The Lucky Strike had, apparently, only just barely made it into desolation orbit, following a freefall maneuver, the highly dangerous technique of transitioning up or down through multiple strata in one translation. A maneuver which cost a fortune in energy, typically burned out the engines, and increase the chances of slamming the ship and its contents into the otherwise intangible frequency barriers that delineated each unique vibrational stratum. With most of its internal systems rendered inoperable, the Lucky Strike had locked itself into a deteriorating orbit around desolation. Bassett, the senior engineer Tiff had taken under her wing, teaching him the ins and outs of a tiff ranian reconfigured engine system, conveyed in his message to their home base that he was abandoning the ship. Tiff desperately tried to reply regarding her own trick to restarting the engines cold, 
but Bassett was only sending, not receiving. Tiff read panic in his voice. Bassett's last words said he was using the life pod and bringing the captain with him. They were all that were left. Only Dante had also contracted whatever contagion had apparently exterminated the rest of the crew. That was his only message. 7. Throughout the night, Veslin's efforts to contact Redemption Spaceport's emergency services had proven unproductive. She felt as if a wall of silence had descended, cutting her off from any answers or solace, abandoning her in a prison of her own heart, isolating her spirit behind walls no one could see yet she could only pound against in futility. I only wanted to know if he'd made it, Veslin said to Talitha, and another torrent of tears burst from within her guilt-ridden soul. I just needed someone to tell me if my Dante was alive or dead. Veslin could only relive her last hours with Dante Stokes. Following their second round of lovemaking that last evening, in the nearly transcendent afterglow, Veslin had run her hand through the dark curly hair of his olive-hued chest, tracing again the contours of his outrageous scar. You shouldn't be here, she said. What do you mean? In this bed, in my life. But here you are, and that has to mean something. He was silent for over a minute, as if collecting his more serious thoughts from amidst the tangle of random musings he'd left strung across the floor. Finally, he said, You're going to hate me tomorrow. She yawned, then tried to stifle it, distorting the cadence of her words. <laughs> I can never hate you. He chuckled. You've hated me since the night we met. No, she confessed. It wasn't you. They made love again. She woke up to find him gone. Tiff eased the internal tension by concluding the narrative. She, too, had been sobbing in varying degrees throughout the unfolding tale, but had tried to prevent either of the other two from noticing her. Two Comfed security flash cops came to the hangar not too long after this afternoon's sunrise, Tiff conveyed precisely, as if getting the details correct was somehow important to her version of events. One of them was tall, only not as tall as you, she added, gesturing toward Talitha's height. The other was short, just, just a little taller than me. Uh, officer stinks or stanks or it was something like that. Talitha seemed to allow herself a nearly audible smirk of both recognition and contempt. Tiff continued. They just didn't seem appropriate for the news they'd come to break. Like a formality. I answered, but Vez was right behind me, and she kind of took over. Tiff looked at Veslin, the older woman downing her next cup of black coffee in a series of straight gulps. Where it was all going was anybody's guess, but she'd had to be reaching her limit any cup now. The detox pills were also kicking in. She'd given herself three times the recommended dosage. She gave Tiff an affirmative nod. Tiff resumed. They didn't ask. They, they just told us. We were at the hangar of the cargo freighter Lucky Strike. That the ship had been lost, and unfortunately everybody aboard had been lost with it. Vez asked them if that included the captain. 
The tall one only said they weren't at liberty to discuss matters of security. That their presence here was a courtesy ComFed provided, and we should be more appreciative for all they do for us. Stank said there'd be some kind of formal statement from Redemption authorities by week's end, and to be patient. That was it, Tiff concluded with a small huff that matched her stature. Veslin rejoined the narrative. I wish I had had my work gloves on right then and there. Lay the bastards out flat. She finished her next cup, then added as if it mattered. I started drinking after that, and I didn't stop till you rang the klaxon. Not counting the coffee. You'll excuse me, please. Veslin set the cup down and slipped off toward the bathroom to commandeer its facilities as she'd once, a seeming lifetime ago, stolen them from the intentions of Dante Stokes. This has been Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces, Book One, Desolation's Tears, read by the author. Audio and video production by A.J. Blackburn. Original music composed and performed by Frankie Caffrey. Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces and B.J.L.G.'s Dark Spaces are copyright 2022 by Brian J.L. Glass.